Hello, I'm Steve Nunn, President and CEO of The Open Group. Welcome to Toolkit Tuesday, where we highlight the various components and leading experts of the Architects Toolkit, a collated portfolio of the most pertinent technology standards for enterprise architects. During the series, I'll be calling on a number of recognized experts who will bring their particular insights on how to most effectively use the various tools in the Architects Toolkit. We'll have a mix of interviews, panel sessions, and pre-recorded presentations along the way. While all standards of the Open Group are designed so they can be adopted independently of one another, the greatest value for an organization can be derived when they're used in unison. The sum of the parts should be greater than the whole. In the Architects Toolkit, we have collated a portfolio of the most pertinent ones for architects together, all in one place. For most of these tools, certification from the Open Group is also available, so practitioners can demonstrate that they have the skills required, and recruiters can take the guesswork out of the recruitment process, all backed up by our Open Badges program. Hammer time. Okay. Not a golden hammer story, but actually for once giving the hammer some much needed credit. Hammers hit nails 99% of the time it works. Sometimes the nail can bend, the wood split. A simple online search using the terms hammer innovation will show up a variety of weird and wonderful ways you can improve the process and the tools. But fundamentally it works most of the time. So my point. How much time do we as architects spend seeking to improve the hammer, the tool? There's an argument that a bent nail is actually the thing to look at. Maybe we need improved nails rather than hammers. But actually what I'm really getting to is this. All this hammer or even nail innovation actually gets in the way of looking at the really important part. And that is worrying about what it is that we want to do with what we are actually constructing, the business outcome. Welcome to Toolkit Tuesday, everybody. Um, I hope wherever you are, you're um, keeping safe and well. Uh, great to have you with us today. Thank you for taking uh, time out of your day. And thank you up front to Paul Homan of IBM for another great uh, uh, EA minute. And um, I never thought I'd, uh, as a Sheffield United fan uh, that Paul is, I never thought he'd talk about uh, the importance of hammers. And that's, it's given I'm a West Ham fan, then uh, that's great to hear, Paul. Thank you for that. Couldn't resist it. Um, welcome wherever you are, as I say. Um, we have uh, the topic today is zero trust and the importance of it. And we have uh, two great speakers uh, to take us through that. Before we do, um, just a quick word on how we do questions, uh, a bit of housekeeping. Um, please use the Q&A channel to ask questions of our presenters today. Um, that's where I'll be looking to uh, to see if any come in. Uh, usually there are plenty. Uh, we won't get to all of them possibly, but please uh, uh, please use the Q&A channel. And to get to the Q&A channel, uh, if you don't see it already on your screen, click the three dots in the bottom right hand corner of your screen and that will give you the option to click on Q&A and there you are. Um, you can uh, ask the questions that way. Please use the chat channel, and some of you already are, I see, um, to uh, communicate with um, uh, the other um, participants in the broadcast today. And uh, we love hearing where you're all from. You'll see some of that happening. So uh, please use the chat channel for that and the Q&A for questions. So just before we uh, we dive into today, um, two weeks ago, we had uh, a uh, bit, something a bit different on Toolkit Tuesday. We were able to uh, join our TOGAF user group live from Edinburgh. So if you haven't seen uh, that recording yet and you weren't able to join us either either live or um, uh, uh, in person there in Edinburgh, um, then please do go look at that. Uh, there were some uh, great presentations during that and the first two of the uh, to TOGA Fuser group we captured for our Toolkit Tuesday audience. So moving to today, Zero Trust. And uh, we have, uh, as I say, two great speakers to introduce it. The first is my colleague, John Linford, who is the forum director for two of our forums here at the Open Group, our Security Forum and our Open Trusted Technology Forum. And John supports the leaders and participants of those forums in utilising the resources of the Open Group to facilitate collaboration and follow the Open Group standards process to publish their deliverables. 
joining John today, and in fact, uh, starting off the presentation today, uh, Nikhil Kumar, who represents the Architecture Forum as the Zero Trust Architecture Working Group Chair. Nikhil is the president and founder of Applied Technology Solutions, Inc., a visionary organization creating the future of technology solutions. We're in good hands on the subject today, folks. Um, so a warm welcome from Toolkit Tuesday, please, to John Linford and Nikhil Kumar. Thank you for having us, Steve. Um, You're welcome. So, you know, zero Trust, and we, as we kick off this conversation, uh, Zero Trust is really one of the most important things that I see in the when I speak to folks it, it, who are dealing with information security and, and, and digital transformation or cloud migrations. And so today we're going to talk about it. We're going to take this opportunity to introduce some concepts and kind of start answering the why. Why are we doing this? And this is the kickoff for a number of different webinars that we'll be talking about. And John will give some in, insight on those. John, do you want to add something to that? No, I think you covered it. So let's just go ahead and get going. Um, as with any discussion, it makes sense to define what it is we're talking about. So critical to us is defining, first of all, what is zero trust and what is zero trust architecture? Zero trust is an information security approach that focuses on data and information security. And this is across the life cycle of that data, the entire entire life cycle of that data asset. And yeah, you should have that security there on any platform and any network. It's not just data and information. We also need to consider all of the other assets in your environment as well. And you also need to make sure that you've got that asset security across the life cycle of the asset as well. When we talk about zero trust architecture, then we are looking at how you actually go about implementing your zero trust security strategy. So critical here is that you need to have well-defined and assured standards, such as those that we're providing in the open group through the ZTA working group, uh, as well as technical patterns and guidance for organizations. It's important to realize that zero trust is the information security framework for the digital enterprise. And that's important to understand from a perspective, especially for those who are senior leaders in the security or in the enterprise architecture space. It's important to realize that this cross cuts across the enterprise and it's not just one product, one solution, one little bit of thing somewhere. This is across the board. And so we'll talk a little bit more as we go through the presentation, but that's just as a context to remember. John. So how did we get here? Well, zero trust isn't exactly a new concept, even if the term has become kind of the hot word of the 2020s, the at least beginning of this decade. Uh, if we look back to 2004, late 90s, early 2000s, that's really where these ideas got started. Uh, back then, we had kind of two conflicting approaches to this. We had network access control architectures, sort of your traditional castle and, and moat approach, where you've got really strict security on the outside, but once you're in, you're kind of free to move around. Um, on the other hand was the Jericho Forum, which put out in their uh, Jericho Forum commandments, as well as additional publication, the notion of deperimeterization. So back in the early 2000s, we had one group focusing on the fact that, yeah, maybe your network isn't the end all be all of security and you shouldn't just trust that when they're inside, they're only going to do good things. Moving forward then in 2010, we had Forrester through John Kindervog coined the term zero trust. Even if it came into popular use in the early 2020s, uh, the term's been around for a decade or so now. Then moving forward to 2014, we had Microsoft advocating for assume breach as well as for assume continuous growth. So you've got to be able to keep up with the enterprise as it grows, but you also need to account for breaches happening and having happened, right? If you're looking at an attacker being in your network for say 60 days, you need to be able to continue on even with that presence there. We also had the Google Beyond Corp uh, publications happen around this time, focusing on being able to work anywhere. We then get moving forward to 2016, conditional access, looking at being able to meet these evolving and adapting business needs to where we are today with ongoing initiatives around zero trust and passwordless uh, access and work on zero trust from a variety of sources, including the Open Group, NIST, the World Economic Forum, and uh, US executive order that's about a year old now. To just uh, add a little comment there, how many of you maintain 
a file or a scratch pad where you write your passwords down. Just kidding. But that's true even today. And that's one of the reasons why we moved towards multi-factor authentication and pass passwordless initiatives. And as you'll see, what happened is this zero trust journey really sort of started in our context in 2018 when we had a cup of coffee with me and Jim Hytel and we said, oh, well, we need to do something because this is something we're seeing across the board. And it started really taking off and we started the whole open group activity. We authored the zero trust core principles. That is a very seminal piece of work. I strongly recommend anyone who's on the call to go attend and see it, read it. Uh, and that, and we worked closely with NIST at that point of time. And that, that core principles translated out in the USEO executive order by President Biden about now almost a year or two ago. And that led to the larger adoption of zero trust. And as John has spoken, he's talked about all these different attributes. Uh, I think we can move on, John, and we'll talk a little bit about the WIFM. So you saw in the last slide all the different reasons why we're doing zero trust, right? And and you know, we're like, okay, this has been our evolution. Why is there that evolution? Why is zero trust important today? It's because we're dealing with changing business models and drivers. Sears Roebuck and Company was the first distributed sales company, I would say, in the world, uh, at least in the way we know it. it. You know, the Sears Roebuck catalog was available with any in any pioneer town, and it went along with the stagecoach. So it didn't change because when shift occurred to the digital era, Sears struggled with it. And the classic enterprises have all struggled with that transformation. Institutional knowledge became irrelevant or became obsolete very rapidly. Channels of communication changed very rapidly. The relationships between partners, influencers, sales channels, your vendors, and your own subsidiaries started evolving very rapidly. And that led to an evolving ecosystem. You need, you're dealing with a continuously changing technology landscape, the cloud, artificial intelligence, IoT, Things are changing continuously, and you have to deal with all these new assets, entities, and growing complexity. Regulatory, geopolitical, and cultural forces have really started changing the dynamic. Think about GDPR, or for an, uh, or on the other side of it, the concept of privacy in China. For global corporations, they're both impacted by that. Globalization and deglobalization are um, shifting to and fro very rapidly. Uh, who would have thought about a war in, in Europe, right? So these things occur at a, a, and are occurring at a dizzying pace as things change. Disruptive events like COVID and 2008 crisis also have been really unpredictable and coming out of the blue. Finally, the shift to remote work started before, as Beyond Corp started before, well before COVID, but got accelerated by COVID. And organizations are understanding the value in allowing people to have a better lifestyle, you know, uh, and, and, and then quality of life and the ability to do these things. So these were the founding reasons, the fundamental reasons in this new digital era about why we need zero trust. And, you know, as we go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about what does that really translate to? It translates to zero assumed trust. Let's take that as a cornerstone, right? It doesn't mean that you don't trust anything. But you don't create those bars and then like John mentioned earlier, once you're inside those bars, you can do whatever you like. And that's how we've got so many breaches. But you say that, look, we transferred that security to the asset. And that allows us to deal with those things which are important in this digital era, complexity, velocity, and disruption. So those assets that you have, if they're protected the asset level and the relationship is between the consumer and the asset, then that really helps you to define things in terms of policies. Again, that becomes adaptive access control. Data centricity, you know, breaches occur all the time. We know it with, and they have been occurring with a greater crescendo as the threat space keeps growing, right? So data centricity becomes important. If I use techniques such as tokenization, homomorphic encryption, et cetera, based on what is acceptable, et cetera, I can basically reduce the, the value of the business value of the assets being stolen to the attacker. And so that enables us to operate much more effectively, right? And you can basically move much faster. Uh, some, some standards organizations and, and some entities, industry groups have already started moving on that. PCI 
started long ago. And this allows us to reduce the threat space, another cornerstone, right? Finally, assuming breach. Well, you have up to 60 days in some lines of business, for example, in the higher ed sector, for which the attacker is on your network planning an attack. After 60 days, they launch their attack. So they know everything, probably the monitor of the network as well as you do. So you need to be able to easily and quickly throttle down the blast radius, reduce the impact and the scope and the, of, of the attack. You need to be able to apply least privilege. Software engineers have done that for the longest time. We always applied the law of Demeter and said, okay, we encapsulate and know your neighbor. We need to do that in information security. Least privilege is an old information security concept, but now it becomes across the board enterprise wide. You need to think about phishing training. You need to build out systems. You need to gamify what you do. All these things now are necessary in order to work in this new modern digital enterprise. And as we go to the next slide, we'll show you how, when we talk about zero trust as being a strategy, how do we get there? So at the top row, you'll see business assets, threats, and risk. And basically, this is about the business. So those business assets and the threat space in which you operate determine how you build your security architecture. Risk is how you kind of gauge what is acceptable and not. And that translates down to capabilities, to a roadmap, and an operating model. And so these, these zero trust capabilities allow you to align with what you do. The mission and vision align with your organizational business mission and vision, with your technology mission and vision, and with your security overall enterprise mission and vision, if there's any gaps there. The roadmap is how you kind of roll this out. It's a strategy that you're implementing. And the operating model is basically about what kind of a company are you and what's your company's structure and how does the business operate? Otherwise, you're kind of swimming against the tide. Um, and, and you'll see down below, we have design and build and how you actually translate that to enterprise and solution architectures and make that roadmap real. And how do you deal with the people? You know, there are folks who are going to administer things. The folks who are going to build things out. How do you make it more efficient? How do you deal with a continuous change? And, this, and the open group has actually initiated a lot of industry standards and activities to enable that after what we did with the core principles and the commandments. And those are a risk model, a zero trust implementation model using a three pillar model structure. Uh, there's an information security ISM model coming out focused on zero trust, and there's a zero trust reference model. And these different things will be coming out in our standards process. I think a snapshot is due in the, in the spring or, or summer of next year. And that'll really help people start translating this to reality. So we're providing that success of uh, crescendo of how to execute. John, if you want to go to the next slide. So you've heard about a little bit about what's coming, a little bit about sort of what that end state looks like, but how do you start to move toward that? And that's where you can take advantage of what we have already done. Chiefly here, we're looking at the zero trust commandments. These commandments we acknowledge are in many cases aspirational, uh, which ones you prioritize are going to depend on the type of organization you are, the types of goals that you're trying to implement. But we also need to point out that these are guardrails. So these aren't hard, strict, fast, absolute rules. It, we're not saying go the complete opposite direction and do whatever the heck you want. Instead, you should use these commandments to help influence your decisions and guide you through your journey towards zero trust, especially as you're going through your digital transformation. Um, so these provide that shared vision and shared understanding. These are something that you can print out the single page version of these and plaster your walls with them use these to get everybody on the same team with where you are going. And we've covered a couple of these topics a little bit already. There are a few others that we want to call out. Uh, chief among these is enabling pervasive security. You want everybody in your organization on board and part of the team sport that is, in this case, cybersecurity. So you want these zero trust norms and cultures integrated throughout your entire organization. We've already touched on utilizing least privilege, but we do really want to make sure that that is there and that you are removing privilege as soon as it is no longer needed. We don't want to see these privileges continue through people as they move throughout the organization. If you really no longer need access to something, you shouldn't have that access anymore. And then of course, we want to try to simplify security as much as possible, and we want it to be sustainable. 
We want people to be able to use the security that is in place to accomplish their jobs, to achieve their goals, and not feel like they need to try to get around the security measures that are in place. We want to avoid IT shadow IT, and we want people to be able to work efficiently and effectively. We want security to keep up with the agility of the organization as it proceeds and progresses and adapts. Anything you wanna add here, Nikhil? Sure, so I think what I would always like to call out is that while these are aspirational, when you start and execute your zero trust journey, always think about the commandments as those guardrails, which allow the entire enterprise to align together to make it into a simple communication across the enterprise. As John put it, the thing that you stick up on your wall or in your virtual wall so that you can, you know, actually look at it and say, hey, you know, are we doing these things? And this should be in your security communications that go across the enterprise as we move forward. Perfect. And back to you, John. So what's coming? Well, Nikhil teased at the beginning that we do have a series of webinars planned. These are in the works and development. We don't have an exact timeline for these just quite yet. So watch this space to hear more about them. Keep an eye on communications from the open group, but we are planning at least four more, more in-depth focus uh, areas here. So on the driver's requirements, capabilities, and our work on that zero trust reference model. So you'll be able to learn more about that risk model, the ISM model, um, as well as the corresponding architectural capabilities and building blocks that go with them. Uh, we have one on identity and access management. Lots of uh, chatter in this space about how theoretically that's all zero trust is. It's not all zero trust is, but it, uh, identity and access management are absolutely foundational to zero trust. We then have one planned around zero trust security operations. So tying your modern security operations into your zero trust architecture. And then as well, one planned around zero trust and the hybrid of everything environment. So these should be good, more in-depth topics. You also already have full access to everything that we've put out and published. So our zero trust core principles, white paper and the commandments guide. We also have a previous webinar that goes into much more depth of those zero trust commandments. Uh, and that top link there will take you to an overview of what the ZTA working group is actively developing right now. Chief among these is the zero trust reference model that we are taking that snapshot approach. So as Nikhil said, we're expecting that first uh, iteration to come out early to mid next year. Uh, we also are now working at actually consolidating the core principles and the commandments into a standard around which ideally we'll be able to build an individual knowledge-based certification program. So keep an eye on this space. And if you are a member of either the security forum or the architecture forum of the open group, or if your organization is a gold or platinum member of the open group, you can start participating with us right now. We then have our contact information for when these slides are made available. We both absolutely welcome you to reach out to us via email or to connect with us on LinkedIn. And at this point, I think we're happy to take some questions. John, Nikhil, thank you both very much. I know, I know how hard it is to uh, <coughs> cover a, a topic as uh, as broad and important as this in uh, in a short time, but you've given us a great baseline. So um, thank you very much for that. Um, so uh, a few questions. One of the things that that um, that that is difficult about zero trust <laughs> is, and you've kind of alluded to this a bit. It's kind of everywhere, um, it, you know, it's it's mentioned everywhere and it's a little confusing to to some um, to say, well, what is zero, what is zero trust architecture? Um, so what's causing that confusion? Well, if I was a network provider building on that network access model and I was selling product for that, what would I define zero trust as? <laughs> Yeah. Would just define it in the context of zero trust segmented net networks, right? right? So there is some of that legacy. There's also because there hasn't been the ground rails and the structure and the terminology and the, and the space was not properly defined. Uh, that's also been a cause for that confusion because everybody kind of defines it the way they would like to that, right? right. And so that's why, for example, the core principles paper was so pioneering because it started setting the stage. That's why it translated into that executive order. It started laying that groundwork across the world. And uh, and then that's why we're doing some of the things like we're thinking of glossaries and, and, and standard reference models. That's helping sort of clear up the the cobwebs and clearing up the, you know, whatever I want zero trust to be is what it is today. Right. 
Right. So, sure. John, sure. if you want to add. Uh, just to, to kind of continue what you were saying that we are, we are seeing some clarity start to come in here. I'm continuously seeing now people say that zero trust is holistic in nature. It's not just zero trust network access. Uh, I know that that term zero trust network access used to be kind of a, the hot word to get around to doing full zero trust. But I'm also now starting to see it used as kind of an intermediary stage. So right. people are saying you move from your current stage to having zero trust network access to your end goal of a full zero trust architecture. Right. Okay. Um, question come in, uh, has uh, just come in. Um, are you aware of any key findings from zero trust assessments and audits conducted and published in, in 2022? Um, or a uh, second part of the question, as cyberspace hacking has advanced as well, are there any key pointers to enterprise zero trust initiatives? So let's go with both of those questions. You know, again, there's been a bit of buzz and we actually have conducted and I don't exactly know, John and I will probably have to circle back on when we will publish that survey that we did. We studied both the industry and the academia and uh, provide on the product vendor side too. So there were some really interesting things that came out of that. There was a lot of alignment, for example, and things which Frankly, I didn't expect like effective computing being important for people, uh, the need to be able to incorporate zero trust in different areas, the shared vision of it, of the deparameterization of things, uh, things which are a radical change for the traditional security architect and frankly, the, uh, you know, the tech side too, the enterprise architects. Um, the other thing uh, to, to call out was we've started laying that foundation, right? So we're starting to make, sorry, what was the second part of the question for you just deep in it, apologize. It was, it was basically as cyber, as cyberspace hacking is advanced right. so, as well. So, right, so there are major initiatives. I mean, uh, I mean, I can't give out individual customer information, but there are major initiatives which are going on across both in the industry as well as in the government sector, the different agencies to implement zero trust. And a lot of what we've talked about today, organizations are rapidly pursuing and how they're doing their modern sec ops, how they're implementing um, you know, data centricity, how they're shifting to asset level assessments, how they're preparing for blast radius reduction. There's a huge adoption of that going on across the industry. Now, the part of that is obviously the velocity standards are needed. And that's part of what the open group is really engaged in because people struggle. How do we actually define this? Right. And, and that's why we're putting down the three pillar model. So how do I actually execute on these things? And so these are all uh, things that are that we're seeing, at least in the industry, I'm seeing a lot of movement on it right now. I would say zero trust is starting to come of age. Uh, there's a huge movement in it. John? Um, well, we will see more, um, I'm sure. So um, we're nearly out of time, but one I'll um, I'll come to you first on this, John. Um, how do the deliverables that you're working on here on Zero Trust kind of integrate into the broader works from the Open Group? Excellent question. We are actively following what's happening in the Digital Practitioners Work Group. We're making sure that what we put out takes into consideration the glossaries and roles that they are already developing. Uh, as Nikhil said, we're planning to integrate our own specific zero trust definitions into that now snapshot version of the glossaries and roles document. Um, but then as well, I know that there are security consideration areas in the DP DPBOC, the digital practitioner's body of knowledge, and we absolutely plan to incorporate zero trust work into that. Um, and then of course, the TOGAF standard. So making sure that anything we put out on architectural principles, capabilities, building blocks, we're making sure that everything aligns with uh, the TOGAF approach to these things so that there is harmony. These can be actively used together. Great stuff. Thank you. And I know that in the in the presentation, which will be uh, made available on the Open Group YouTube channel, in there, there are some uh, links to uh, the documents that you referenced. Uh, another way to get them is to go to the Open Group uh, homepage, opengroup.org, and um, go to the library um, on the top uh, top bar across there. Go to the library and you'll find them in there. Um, and also um, to to mention, there are some there are some questions coming in, particularly around uh, use of zero trust in the healthcare industry and things like that, which we uh, we can't get to in in, uh, in the interest of time. But um, your contact details are in the 
presentations and I'm sure you'll be uh, happy to uh, take those questions if uh, if the any members of the audience uh, contact you afterwards I'm sure you will absolutely one question Steve is I think a lot of folks have asked about being able to access the webinar before yeah. and after and I think maybe we can respond to them so. yes absolutely and that, that well that's uh, it will be available on the um, uh, on the open group YouTube channel this uh, this recording uh, and the and the slides and therefore all the links will be there so um uh people both um who are here who want, who want to go back and see those and uh some people who've registered uh and will look at it in a in a time zone more uh, more amenable to them um will will be able to get that and when we come to the webinar series that you've sorted as john said look look for more information from the open group on those um because that's going to be a, a a great series but um but for now folks we have to uh, respect people's time on toolkit tuesday and and uh, including the the two of you so thank you very much um john Lin linford and nikhil kumar appreciate it thank, thank you thank you for having us thank you and uh, so that's it for this week. Um, in two weeks' time, we will shift our focus to the Archimate modeling language um, and uh, the tip of the iceberg, what to expect and what's next for the Archimate 3.2 specification. And uh, to do that will be my colleague Kelly Cannon and Leos Martis from the Architecture Forum, uh, it's the Archimate Forum here at the Open Group. So that's two weeks' time, November the 15th. Um, thank you all for being here today. Um, those of you with questions that we didn't get to, I, I uh, hope they will be answered by our speakers. Uh, I know they're always very, very keen to uh, to do that. So um, I think you can expect that. Thank you for joining us and taking time out of your day. I'm Steve Nunn. This has been Toolkit Tuesday. <laughs>